Welcome back to another episode of Six Picks Music Club, a music podcast for people who scream sneeze. Well, hey, hey, we are back and here with you for another episode of Six Picks Music Club, where we pick six songs for you, our loyal listener. I am Dave, your host, with my good, good friends, Jeff. Sizzlin. And Russ. Hey there. What's up, boys? How are we doing today? Doing well, man. Dude, I'm hot. Yeah? Hot to trot. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe take off that uh, that sweatsuit and just kind of turn a fan on. Oh, yeah, it is, it is warm <laughs> down here. We are excited for today because speaking of sweatsuits and maybe sweatsuits that were worn backwards by a, a young hip hop duo named as Crisscross, this is actually an episode dedicated to Backwards Day. And so we're going to be going through songs today from two generations, starting with 1969 and going to 1996. So you see how those are backwards and flipped and whatnot. Anyways, before we get too crazy, we got to get into the clubhouse. There's a lock on the door. We need the passcode. Who's got the passcode? Mac and cheese nuts. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the secret ingredient is to take a little sour cream and mix it in with the mac and cheese nuts so that it's like extra creamy. <laughs> creamy cheese nuts. <laughs> All right. Well, I hope you brought your appetites because we got a lot to serve you today. So let's let's open up the doors and get right in there, everybody. All right, find your spot. Find your spot, everybody. I've already find a letter on the floor. Get around in a circle. Okay, crisscross applesauce. I'm really excited about our songs today. Once again, we've picked a bunch of songs that I think are great, and I am excited to share with our listening audience here. But as usual, we're going to check in with the guys and see what's going on. Fro, what's your story? Made a visit to the... Tactical gear store. Oh. That's what I'm going to tell you about. Guns and knives and things? Not guns. So we're I'm in Canada, so not guns. Oh. But it's all the other stuff. <laughs> so when you go to the gun shop that outfits police officers with stuff, it's it's that, but it's everything but guns. Costumes and the stuff. <laughs> you could get like tactical vests and knives and flashlights and good, all the good stuff but you just can't get guns there like m- militia gear yeah. militia gear yeah so i go to etobicoke and i have to pick up a, a crib that we ordered because we're having a child soon and it was from like this lovely French man that has a nursery in the city and then he goes to his shop and has things delivered. And so I was doing something that was like very domestic, but on the way I saw a tactical gear supply store and I was like, I had been looking for some tactical gear, uh, <laughs> so which I had. I wanted a telescoping baton. Why? We have very big and menacing raccoons around here that has- <laughs> Are, are troubling. Um, and they climb. <laughs> this is true. I live next to a laneway. And one of them, he looked at me when I was walking down the laneway in the middle of the night and we made eye contact. And he just, he kept staring at me and he was like, and he turned his head slowly and then shinnied up this light pole 30 feet in the air and jumped onto my third floor balcony. Like while Jesus. I was watching him do it, and I was like, oh my God. And so I was just thinking to myself, what if I open that balcony door and this fucking raccoon jumps in at me and just just the scene from Elf <laughs> like just starts eating my neck off? So, anyways, I go in after I went and picked up the crib from the very nice uh tiny French guy. I go to the tactical gear store and I I like militia. Yeah, militia store. I kind of like stealed my reserve because I have an aunt named Militia. (laughs) Militia Etheridge is her name. (laughs) (laughs) I know gun store dudes. I don't, I'm not a guns person myself, but I know what they are. And it's exactly as I expected. I go in, a guy's name is Dean. He has he's he has an extra large body in a large black shirt, you know, so it's a little schmedium on him. It's a little small, a little bit of beard dandruff on it. 
you know um <laughs> he's got a he's got a cap that's real tight on his noggin um and i was like sir i'm looking for telescoping batons and he was like back there where the other guy is and I was like, all right, cool, thanks. And so I went over and I looked. And then he like jumps up. He's like, let me show you a couple things about him, right? So he's just like, because <laughs> he's just assertive man. It's funny because they're basically like macho fashionistas, these guys. They're not police. They're not military. They're people that do clothes for those guys. Do you know what I yeah. mean? Like clothes and and accessories. It's like Claire's for law enforcement. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's, it's Claire's, but instead of teenage girls, it's for law enforcement. <laughs> we just lost half of our listeners in Texas. <laughs> so anyway, he gets he gets one of the batons out, um, and he's like, what are you going to use this for? And I was like, I don't know, man. I got raccoons, and I live on a laneway, so there's riffraff out there. And he was like, well, that's why I have a shotgun. Like, and I was like, I'm sure you do, Dean. I'm sure you do. And he was like, anyways, this is how you use it. And he's like, you pull it out like this. <laughs> and he like jerked his arm back. And I was like, ha, ah, okay, uh, I'm cool. I'm cool. I feel okay. And he's like, let me talk to you about strike zones. And I was like, oh, God. oh here we go. Please. So he's like, you get it out like this. And uh, if you want to put them on the ground and uh, run away, then you're going to want to hit him right here in the neck. I was like, in the neck, dude. <laughs> I'm trying to kill a guy, and he's like, I mean, it's not going to kill him. It's going gonna, it's gonna to debilitate and demoralize him, but not kill him. And I was like, oh, okay. And he's like, but really what you want to do is you want to smash that forearm into bits. <laughs> Or take it downtown to the knee. I swear he said that. And I was like, I was like, okay, cool. So what are we talking about price range? <laughs> and uh, and so he was like, the difference between the ones that are really expensive and this one I just showed you is that you have to close this one like this. Whoa! You do have to close it by smashing it down on the ground. <laughs> We are going to settle right into our main topic today, where we talk about our Backwards Day tribute, where we look at songs from 1969, as well as songs from 1996. But I think we should start at the beginning. So, Jeff, why don't you lead us off with your first pick of 1969? Neil Young, Cinnamon Girl, off of the 1969 record, Everyone Knows This Is Nowhere. Damn it, that song rocks, right? Hell yeah, dude. That's yeah, good. It's written in double drop D tuning, and it's famously got a guitar solo that only features one note played over and over, which is D also. People either love that or they hate it and think it's stupid, but obviously it, it jams, and it's awesome live too. He really like sells it live if you've ever seen Neil Young. Crazy Horse are uh, Billy Talbot on bass, Ralph Molina on drums, and then sometimes Frank Pancho San Pedro, and then Danny Witten, who is a vocalist that died. He's also featured on vocals on this record. But so I like Neil Young solo, and I like Neil Young okay when he's with Crosby, Steels, and Nash. But when he's with Crazy Horse and those old dudes are up there, just hammering away on their guitars and jamming really gets the old blood boiling for me. You know what I mean? You, you look at Eddie Vedder and he has like the homage altar to Neil Young in his whole house. It's just like, I feel like he, he looks at Neil Young and so that's the kind of rock and roll star I want to be. And like, that's how I want to model my band as just my conjecture, but they ended up playing songs together too. Oh yeah, dude. And Neil Young famously was a big fan of punk rock because he thinks it saved rock and roll in the late seventies when nothing was going on. And he was also a big fan of the Seattle guys and Kurt Cobain. He wrote a song about Kurt Cobain's passing and it's a great song. And, uh, so yeah, he's, he's always fashioned himself a member of their community. One of their elders, the elder flannel of the bunch, <laughs> you know, they call this song proto grunge, right? Fuck. Yeah. Cinnamon girl. Nobody really knew what that was about. 
it's he's a dreamer of pictures or she's a dreamer of pictures that run in the night see her together see us together chasing the moonlight my cinnamon girl so it's you know it makes you think about the beach or about an acid trip in the desert whatever you want you know uh you and your partner but the internet is a big stupid animal and so we don't know if anything is actually accurate but a woman came forward and said that she was in fact the cinnamon girl and wrote about it on facebook and it's a woman from Etobicoke, where I went to the tactical supply gear store. What? <laughs> Strangely enough, I did not plan on that at all. That is just a coincidence. But she said that one night she kind of snuck out to go party and she met Neil Young and she was like, I'm interviewing people to be my boyfriend. Do you want to participate? And he was like, oh, I guess so. I don't know. And she's like, it's going to involve potentially a lot of kissing. And he's like, oh, it sounds pretty good to me. You know, how Neil Young is. <laughs> and so they hung out and like hooked up a little bit. I don't know how far it went. Hold up. You didn't message this woman on Facebook and ask her how she takes Neil Young's mac and cheese nuts? <laughs> <laughs> so people in her high school called her the Cinnamon Girl. So that's a claim that she's made. But then she got super sick afterwards and they didn't talk for a while. But he also got sick and had a 103 degree fever and wrote Cinnamon Girl... And um, what are the other songs, Russ? You also read this, I'm sure. Yeah, I read it. I think he wrote Cinnamon Girl, Cowgirl in the Sand, and... Down by the River. Oh, yeah. He wrote Cinnamon Girl, Cowgirl in the Sand, and Down by the River, all from this record, all badass songs, in the same fucking day. And he did it while he had a 103-degree fever. I mean, you can write a lot of songs if you're taking some shortcuts like, hey, this guitar solo is going to feature only one note repeated <laughs> over and over that people are going to think fucking jams. I think Neil Young actually looks to write really simple uh, guitar solos. There's a number of his songs that feature a uh, relatively uncomplex guitar solo. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's cool because he came up with so many memorable melodies and licks and stuff like that. He doesn't have to prove his that he has chops. If you go into Guitar Center and pick one up off the shelf and start playing the solo from <laughs> Southern Man, they're going to throw you out of there. Yeah, why? Because it's so bad? <laughs> it's like it's a two-note solo. It's a, he, he went from the one-note solo to the two-note <laughs> solo. And then it's just it goes into like an atonal kind of chord. It's like... <laughs> But no, he's a wonderful songwriter. He's an American treasure. He's a trailblazer. We're staying with the 60s. What do you got there, Russ? All right. My 69 pick is The Who's Pinball Wizard, the first single from their rock opera, Tommy. It's a story. It rocks. Got some real uh, jamming going on in there. The narrator is a reigning pinball champion and you got tommy this boy who can't see hear or speak he doesn't need sight or sound right he just uh he plays by sense of smell preposterous <laughs> <laughs> the song man explodes with energy you got pete townsend's like iconic guitar riffs and keith moon's thunderous drumming and roger daltrey's powerful vocals just going through it it's a great song fast tempos and then they interweave with slower more reflective sections it's funny about this song because pinball wizard was a strategic last ditch effort to save the who from financial ruin what so there's this guy named nick cone who uh pete townsend brought him in to hear an early version of the album and he was saying that it was just kind of mediocre and he didn't really care for it they needed it to be a hit because they had no money they were going to go bankrupt in a way where the who was at before pinball wizard is I think where we are as a podcast, guys, you know, uh, it's a real shoestring budget at this point. Um, some of our work has become bloated and quite frankly, not that interesting. And so maybe we need to get the critics in here to help us out with a new direction. I thought you were going to say that we've been doing it for five years and like blown through all of our money doing coke and hookers. <laughs> oh, well, I just thought that went without saying. Yeah. So it's part of an opera, though? Like, how does it all play together? Like, what's the story there? 
It's like a one big concept album. So the thing was, they'd written Tommy and they played it for that critic and he didn't like it. So Pete Townsend knew he was a pinball fanatic. Oh. So he writes this pinball song to make him happy. The dude loves the idea, (laughs) gives a glowing review to it, which then becomes a hit. He added a few lines about pinball throughout some different songs in Tommy, so it was more connected. Can you imagine if Nick Cohen was an airplane model enthusiast? (laughs) How that might have changed <laughs> the direction. How do you think he does with airplane glue? <laughs> I was like, hmm, it's accurate, but it just doesn't work that well. That's a lot to say. Yeah. <laughs> with hot glue. Well, okay, that is better, but it just, you don't use hot Sounds glue. Sounds more for dangerous a for a, a blind kid. Yeah. <laughs> Another cool, so I was just thinking of the words, beat the bumpers, which is a real cool way to refer to playing pinball. Beating the bumpers. Yeah. They made the movie in 1975 with Jack Nicholson and Anne Margaret and Tina Turner, and they asked Rod Stewart to sing Pinball Wizard. And so he goes and he uh, he asks Elton John. Also a good choice. He's like, hey, they want me to sing this song. I don't, uh, what do you think? And Elton said, don't touch it with a barge pole. I don't know what a barge pole is, but <laughs> that's what he told him. A 10-foot pole. Well, a year later, The Who asked Elton John if he'll sing that portion for Pinball Wizard in the movie. And uh, and he said yes. <laughs> and he says, uh, he's quoted as saying that he doesn't think Rod's quite forgiven him for that yet. So, Ouch. Yeah, I bet not. I bet not. Was that gamesmanship, or did he think that... It was so, the the who was dead, and then suddenly it's a hit, and then, but surely not because it was like five years later. Yeah, it was like five or six years later. So I don't know. Very interesting. Also, a real quick thing: Pete Townsend is the pioneer of destroying instruments on stage. Yeah, yeah. And that was actually inspired by an artist named Robin Page, who had his performance art piece, and he was kicking his guitar down London's Dover Street until it just was nothing. And then Pete Townsend saw that and thought, oh, we should do this on stage. Oh, that's fucking sweet. Let's wreck guitars. All right, and I'll end this one little thing. In 1973, in Daly City, California, the Who were playing, and drummer Keith Moon collapsed twice in the middle of the show due to drug and alcohol use. I think it might have been ketamine, but I'm not sure. After the second time, they couldn't wake him up, so they they were playing a, a few songs without a drummer. I think Roger Daltrey was like playing the tambourine. And finally, Pete Townsend calls out to the crowd and he's like, can anyone play the drums? I mean, well. Yeah, like good though. And so this guy, Scott Halpin, comes up and he plays the whole rest of the set with them. And uh, the band said he did good. And it was one of those like moments where you're like, holy shit. (laughs) Like I've played on stage with the Who. Dude, that's badass. Okay, so in 1978, Keith Moon overdosed on... Clomthiazole, I think. It's used in treating and preventing symptoms of acute alcohol withdrawal. Oh. And that is what he OD'd on. Man, that's dark. He was 32. Oh. Yeesh. That guy, all-time party animal. Like, you'd have to put him in the... If you wanted to just... Who are the biggest party animals if you're going to have, like, the wildest, most fucked-up party that you've ever... Th- Keith Moon has to be in there. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Okay, so it's me now. Um, and my pick for 1969 is from Tommy James and the Shondells. And I'm talking about a little song called Crimson and Clover. God damn it, I love that song so much. So, for real, I, I have a Spotify playlist that's called The Best. It's just called The Best, and it's like 600 of my favorite songs, and Crimson and Clover, definitely up in that biatch. Dude, I love this song, too, and one of the things I love the most about Tommy James and the Shondells is just sort of the journey that they went on as artists throughout their career. They started off singing songs like The Hanky Panky. Like, my baby does the hanky-pank. She does, though. She sure does. Children are a result of that directly. (laughs) They just have been able to switch their style around so uh, frequently and have these different moments where their career has been able to just go on for a long time. 
1968, there's a presidential candidate, Herbert uh, Humphrey. Humphrey, thank you. Herbert Humphrey, who was a, such a huge fan that he said, I want you to be my band on my campaign tour. So so they agree. They're like, yeah, sure, no problem. What? Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> Hubert Humphreys, he had an official band. The group toured with him. They toured with him during the campaign. and He was LBJ's vice president. That's right. Imagine if Al Gore had a band. <laughs> Al Gore's band would be Rascal Flats. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that checks out. It's like Southern-ish. They're doing the cover of Wagon Wheel. (laughs) (laughs) Dude, we need to go back in time and hook that up. Al Gore's like, I love a song with a wheel. I love circular imagery. Circles are better than squares because they roll. Squares don't roll. I'll tell you what else is bad. Music that requires parental advisory sensors. I hate not knowing when an artist has written about coming on something, and I don't know if it's about (laughs) semen, orgasms, or just about joining them outside. But with that sticker, I definitely know which one was intended. So uh, Hubert uh, Hubert Humphrey Herbert Humphrey was so appreciative of them being his his touring Hubert Humphrey Hubert Humphrey was <laughs> Hubert Hubert so Hubert Humphrey was so appreciative that he actually wrote the liner notes to uh to the record uh, Crimson and Clover Dude what Yeah <laughs> it's crazy This is nuts Yeah and it was this song that became this uh, transition for the band into like this psych rock space. It was this definite change of direction. It was written by Tommy and the drummer Peter Lucia Jr. And there's a little bit of controversy or he said, she said on who came up with the name. Because it's funny, they wrote the title of the song before they wrote the song. They were just like, we're going to write a song called Crimson and Clover. Like, we don't know what it is yet, but we're going to write that. That's the song. <laughs> like, OK, cool. Tommy says he woke up from a dream and his favorite color was in his mind, crimson, and he was smelling his favorite smell, clover. And uh, Peter said that he he named it after his hometown high school football team whose color was crimson, and they were playing a team who uh, was a Native American team, and, and, and that name translates into something green. So he's like, yeah, clover. So, Dude, both of those stories are bullshit. <laughs> like they, they were just like, no, it's mine. And then, and then he's like, listen, this is what happened, okay? <laughs> no, 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 guys, this is what happened. This is no. what really no, happened. No, it's based on my <clears throat> high school football team and then smells. Come on. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I guess... Herbert Humphrey was really cool with a lot of psychedelic drugs that were happening. Hubert Humphrey, dude. He's a major figure in the history of the United States. (laughs) I've never heard of him. Humphrey. (laughs) Hubert Humphrey. (laughs) Holy shit. I just learned about Hubert Humphrey and how much he loved psychedelic music. So, yeah. He lost to Nixon in 68. He was supposed to win. But he didn't. He didn't. He would have been a nerdy president, that's for sure. <laughs> anyway, dude, so, yeah, Tommy James, they change. They do acid. They lie to people about the songs. That's- One of the things that was different about this record is that they fired their record company because there was some dispute about a money thing or whatever. And so they got to produce this record themselves, and it was just them in the studio. They recorded this whole song in five hours. They were just messing around, and they're like, wow, what would, I think it would be cool if we ran the vocal mic through the guitar amp and turned the tremolo on. And that's how they got that vocal effect at the end. And that is cool. They had no producer to say, no, you can't do that. Yeah, yeah, the producer was like, no one's ever done that before, Tommy. Tommy, get back in the booth. Get back in the booth. Don't go in the guitar booth. Just go sing your part 67 times. But then the single sold 5 million copies, and it's their most successful, so... That's incredible. But also the tempo change at the end, it just goes into the... Dude, all of it's good. Such a good song. So that's my song from the uh, the last year of one of the greatest decades of rock music, the 60s. And I think rather than snake back and have me go again, Russ, why don't you take the next one? And then I'll go, and then Jeff Rowe, you close this out. I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the... The alpha and the omega. You're God, you're Jesus, yes. Man, I love that. (laughs) I think we just watched him come in his pants. 
Uh, power cum. <laughs> Dude, that ego cum. Mm. <laughs> okay, uh, 18 years after Keith Moon's untimely passing, the music world tragically lost Bradley Noel at age 28 from a heroin overdose. For those of you who don't know, he was a frontman and guitarist for Sublime. Interesting is that he died two months before the self-titled album came out. And uh, my second pick is off that album. It's called Santeria. Good pick, dude. Mm. So I should say, when we decided to do National Backwards Day, I feel like I'm always pulling out things out of the crevices and nooks of whatever I listened to. So I thought I would go much bigger this time and do something, you know, The Who and Sublime, you know, songs that people know. <laughs> so anyway, part of my con contribution to Backwards Day. So like Pete Townsend did with The Critic, you're pandering. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> 100%. Dude, it's such a good choice. So who is the bassist for Sublime? Eric Wilson. I love the bass playing in this. The it's so funky. It's doing like a doon 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 yeah. doon 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 doon. Yeah, dude, that guy's awesome. Santory is cool. It tells the story of a of a heartbroken man fueled by jealousy and anger, contemplating revenge on his ex girlfriend and her new guy, and he you know considers extreme measures, including violence, as in the gun in the mouth, execution, murders. You know, no big deal. Yeah. That's pretty clear. Yeah. Down the throat. It blends several genres, right? It's got like a ska punk energy and choppy guitar riff and Brad Knowles soulful vocals. And then, you know, the chorus, it dives into reggae, which is cool with kind of a laid back groove. At the time of this album's release, Sublime was little known by anyone outside of the, their home base of Long Beach. And when Brad died, there was very little coverage on it because no one even knew who they were. The surviving members of Sublime had no interest to continue to perform under the name, so they pretty much disbanded. Later on, they formed the Long Beach Dub All-Stars, but uh, before that, they were just, they called it quits for the band. And so, just like Nirvana, Sublime died when Brad died. When the album came out, there was no band to promote it. There was no tour or anything. And so the label sent off promo copies of what I got, and the radio stations ate it up, and then they started playing it all the time, and so you got this defunct band that is like on the air and in demand but there's no one to no touring or anything yeah none of that so the santeria was the next single that came out and it was really well received garnering most of his airplay in 97 like a year after the album came out and it was getting so much radio play that the label had to call the radio stations and ask them to stop playing it so they could put out wrong way huh that's weird just bask just keep selling records you idiots god <laughs> dude they used to have it so good record companies they can just do whatever stupid bullshit the album sublime peaked at number 13 on the billboard 200 and got their sole number one hit with what i got but none of these songs were made available as singles in America. So if you wanted to hear the song, you had to buy the album. And because of that, they sold 5 million copies. Yeah, that's amazing. I had it, dude. Everybody had this record because it is so good. Everybody had it. It was produced by Paul Leary of the Butthole Surfers. He, he's one right. who produced this. And he told the Rolling Stone that Sublime, he said, they were the sweetest bunch of guys. But it was chaos in the studio. Yeah. There were times where someone had to go to the bathroom to see if Brad was still alive. So that was what was going on during the recording of that album. Yeah, because like he had gotten clean and then he just like he just started using heroin like more vigorously than ever, right? And that the thing. Yeah. yeah, like kind of like a Philip Seymour Hoffman move. Yeah, dude, they these guys were notorious just hotel and studio records they were yeah. they demolished shit and uh and so you'd you'd have to to circle back you'd have to put brad noel in the uh all-time hard party or yeah, party right like he's there with keith moon hanging out for sure yeah yeah absolutely. alcohol party is pretty different from a heroin party i'll just say i know they recorded this here in austin yeah, at the sure pertinalis at, at willie studio yeah, they sure did. That's cool that Paul was the producer. I didn't know that. This song, when it came out, when it came out, it was like the biggest thing ever, and everybody loved it. And it was like a very tragic story. So, like, I, you know, all of it goes with hand and foot, but 
it's just a little overplayed for me. And like, it's still on the radio. Like, it's still on the radio. It's just goddamn it's a it. Great like, fucking pop song, will dude. Will you ever let him die? He will never rest. Bradley will never rest until you stop. <laughs> you you guys have to stop with it. But you know, it's a good song. Well, at least it's not twenty songs long. Like, check your head. Get over yourself. <laughs> So, so what you, what you, what you want? Half the songs is what I want. (laughs) I love the BC boys, dude, but obviously, (laughs) obviously you can sit in your tower. I'll sit in mine. I lived in Garden Grove, which is like the first track off this record. And this, that song, this whole album to that part of the, of the world, this is gold. Like we were in a bar closing it down and they turned on garden grove and it lit up like a uk pub yeah. singing mr yep. brightside it was just exactly. like That's awesome. everyone was singing it everyone was just like knew every word and i was just like holy shit there's a lot of sublime fans here and they're like yeah this is <laughs> this is sublime town this is fucking garden grove so yeah and it's know. cool they apparently like I mean, for pretty much the whole time he was alive, except the very end of his life, were a party band. They just, they played house parties. It was like them and No Doubt, yeah. They were just totally worked in to that community, and that would have been a really fun scene, I think. Yeah, for sure. Just go surfing and party and play music. Russ, all of your songs in and a heroin death like what's it's just like that's the theme of like the whole pod is like yeah or dismemberment those are the two <laughs> I, I also have people masturbating oh that's right yeah that, well, there you go masturbating heroin jerking doing smack and dismembering sex drugs and rock and roll that's that's the way all right. Well, uh, thank you, Russ. That was a great one. Uh, certainly a classic that takes me straight back to 1996. Man, I can I can tell you where I was when uh, that uh, BMG Music Club uh, envelope came in the mail and uh, I cracked it open. Golly. All right. Well, I'm going to go next with all that energy coming right out of me. Um, and uh, the song that I picked is off of another record from 1996. This record is from a band called Cake, and their uh, second album that they released is uh, called Fashion Nugget. And the song is kind of titular in the name, but not entirely, so it's half titular. The song is Nugget. I gotta be honest, the first thing that I uh, was initially attracted to this song about as a young youth of 16 years old, almost 17, was the amount of uses of the word fuck. It was just really out of left field based on the other singles that had come off the record. And you buy the record for their ubiquitous song, The Distance, which dominated the radio as well. And then you you end up with a, a record that's got the song that Tipper Gore hates the most, uh, yeah. which is this one, Nugget. But uh, yeah, no, I was driving with my aunt years ago, and as the driver picks the music, like, I had the CD, and she was, like, reading something or listening to headphones or something. I don't really know. But this song came on, and I was just kind of side-eye, glancing, seeing if she was going to react or not, and, like, she didn't really, so I didn't think too much about it. And then later, she was like, that band cusses a lot, don't they? And I was like, what? No, I I didn't really know. I don't, I I guess I don't hear it. I, you know, I I just, I'm there for the music more than anything. (laughs) This is one of those bands that like found itself at that nexus where everything is like new metal and post grunge. And, and here comes this band out of San Francisco that, or Sacramento rather, that is none of that. They're like folk and like salsa and jazz and poetry and with like cutting commentary lyrics, taking shots at the music industry, taking shots at the fans. They didn't really fit. <laughs> and like they got all this radio play and uh, the industry just, they didn't know what to do with them. Um, I think Ben Folds is another one like that from that time. Well, also like Cake is kind of confusing archetype wise because you don't really know what they are a case of. Yeah. Because some of it seems like a joke, like they're having fun or they have an inside joke they're not letting you in on. Yeah. But then if you go see them live, they're like a real tight, disciplined, really well-practiced band. And you're like, is this not about fun? I can't tell what's going on, you know? Um, and I think I think it's like, it's also like that with genre. He plays like the vibra slap that... 
thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like has that distinctive acoustic guitar sound, and you're like, is this Western music, or is it like <laughs> rock? Like what? I don't know yeah. what it is. You know. But that's so awesome. Yeah. So like producers didn't know what to do with them. They got put on bills with corn and the Deftones and then the meters and Al Green. They were just like, yeah. I don't know where these guys fit. Try that. That's interesting. And, you know, they got compared to like Deftones and the meters. <laughs> fascinating yeah. oh wow they're so similar the meters and the death tones <laughs> they did get sold to like alternative rock yeah. stations they were being played alongside all of the other yeah. like sublime and death tones it's all that stuff totally even though they did not they're not the same music at all no some a and r guy was like about to get fired and he's like what if i just went to the college campus and i talked to that dj and seen what he's doing and then he's and i'll just sign that band <laughs> yeah it's so crazy because like the strength of this album and that song the distance and the gloria gaynor song they actually got an international tour out of it they were supporting none other than adam duritz himself and the counting crows there's not a ton of songs where they take shots i think politically but this is definitely one where they definitely dive headfirst into those waters, being critical of the heads of state, being critical of corporations. I think capitalism in general, there's a case to be made just kind of looking at all the, the lyrics. And it's this whole call and response thing where it's like you've got the people, the masses saying like, you know, this is fucked up. This is not cool. And then you've got the, the heads of state saying, shut the fuck up. <laughs> nothing's going to change. We're in control. It, it's just an interesting sort of thing to come from the uh, the band that's also covering I Will Survive. I just like, from a line reading standpoint, all of the various ways he manages yeah. to say, shut the fuck up. It's like in yeah. every possible way. And all of them are <laughs> yeah. really good. <laughs> it's like, I wish I could say it like he does. Yeah, this is one that, uh, that I dug a lot. And one that if you didn't get this whole record or you've just only heard the couple of singles from, from this record, just Deserves a deeper dive. Learn to buck up. Get out there. Yeah. Get on that Spotify list and shut the fuck up and listen. That's my 96 pick. It's a good one. Jeff, bring us home, Bubby. Now for my second pick, comma, from 1996, comma, Steel Young and Crazy Horses, Big Time, which is, has a big run in time of seven minutes and 26 seconds. Nineteen ninety six rolls around. Neil Young and Crazy Horse are back for their tenth studio album. Their producer dies. Then they have to cut a record without the producer. And it was hard without old David Briggs. And so then they go in and they just jam. They rock out. And that's this this album, Broken Arrow. I don't think it's a very well known Neil Young and Crazy Horse record, but man, I I personally Love this one, and I hope that I can spread this to our millions of listeners. And it harks back to what he was doing in 1969 on Cinnamon Girl. It's tuned down. It's just up there shredding a little bit, kind of grooving with the other dudes. And it's talking about dreaming again and uh, going to leave the pain behind. I'm still living the dream we had. For me, it's not over. And it kind of feels like he's talking to Cinnamon Girl again, and he's going back to where he was in 1969, around where he moved to San Francisco, which is what the song is about when he moved to California. And I do love that like um, he used more than one note for the solo. I think that's such an improvement. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's such a jammer. You can tell that they're just up there feeling it. Yeah, yeah. No, all jokes aside, it's real, real groovy. This record and listening to these guys jam like that, you can tell that like this is a dude who's been mastering his craft for 30 years and is so in touch with the kind of music that he wants to play. And it just it comes right through the speakers and, and, and it's great. To me, he's a godfather, a godfather of rock and roll. And he just tries to keep the spirit alive. Yeah. You know? And and well, he was like the he's a the the model grunge star, right? Like he grappled with fame and how to deal with that stuff, I think. Yeah, he bought a ranch and stuff. You know, he's he like went off the beaten path. Of course he also married Daryl Hannah, which is you know, so he's not like hiding entirely from fame but they're they're just weird together and that's cool are they still married yeah 
Yeah, they're still married. Oh, wow. Okay, so one of my favorite stories about Neil Young is that when he was coming out with Harvest, he had the recordings done. Uh, I think he records most things fast, but he had a sound engineer basically run the sound through his house and his barn as if they were the left and right speakers of a stereo. So the house had a bunch of speakers stacked up. That was the left and the barn had a bunch of speakers stacked up and that was the right. And then, um, you know, they were, he was outside, I think, with Graham Nash and David Crosby, and they were listening to the record on his ranch, like, maybe, I, I don't know if it's at nighttime, but I imagine it being at night, and they're all, like, zoning out, smoking weed, listening to this record, and at some point, he was like, he thought he thought that the mix wasn't quite right, and he just goes, hey, more barn! <laughs> and so then they turned up the right speaker. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that is one of the things that I miss so much about Twitter was David Crosby evaluating people's joints. Like you would roll a joint and take a picture and tag David Crosby and he would give you notes on it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. God bless that man. Love him so much. Speaking of joints, it's time to blow this joint. Let's wrap it up, bro. <laughs> okay, well, before we get out of here today, I wanted to debut a brand new segment of new songs, new music that we are freaking amped and hyped about. We're going to cue these songs up for you, listener, and for each other, you know, really exposing ourselves to new tracks. So this week, I have some music for the Fuck You from a band that is from the mid-aughts, a band called Clap Your Hands Say Yeah. And oh, yeah, yeah, I know them. They have a new four song ep called piano and voice and it's just basically our dude singing and playing piano at the same time so it's not just a clever name but what about you boys what do you have for the fuck you this week man the new dead poets society album comes out tomorrow so i'm super excited for that oh that's cool what about you fro i've been rocking future islands king of sweden and other tracks off of their new record all right, well, that's going to wrap up our picks this week, where we went back in time and went all backwards in 69 to 96. And uh, thanks for joining us again. That was a lot of fun. I really loved all those songs that you guys picked and pulled. So we will be back in two weeks. Uh, it's going to be a Wednesday. Wednesday's our day, and uh, it's actually Valentine's Day. So if you uh, don't have plans, we'll drop our episode early in the morning, and you can knock us out so that you can you can bang out your other plans later in the day. You know what I mean? All right, we're going to be talking about love and and love gone bad. Until then, just keep jamming, okay? This episode of Six Picks Music Club was produced by Mike Uchi and edited by Mike Hawks. Yeah, we got two mics this week. That's pretty good. Yeah, a couple of mics. So thank you, mics. They make a good team, the mics. Dixie Rec, thank you again for all the work you do, putting together the social feed, putting together... You know, the craft services, trying to find those sponsor dollars. You're just the best. So thank you to the mics and thanks to Dixie. And we'll see you next time. 